Amen. Amen and welcome. It is good to be here, centered and focused on God and prayer. As we begin with those joys and concerns, it helps us remember that surely we are bigger than just this place, and we give thanks that we're able to connect with people in worship on television, through YouTube, and we lift up today and always that we affirm that we are one in the body of Christ, even when we are geographically separated. There are so many good things happening at church this week and this summer. If you would open up your bulletin to your insert, you'll see uh, our meetings listed and then our very first on July 16th. Aren't you so excited? Do you see it? Do you see it? There's one yay. One, two, three. Good job. Pool Church begins July 16th. We are hoping for double the kids we had last year, maybe even triple. Um, there will be yard signs coming. We had hoped they would come by Friday. They did not. Come visit us at church this week. Grab a yard sign. Put it in your yard. We have large vinyl ones around town, but we're hoping to fill in those spots. Um, July 16th, July 30th. And August 6th. Those are all Saturdays. The pool is rented by our church. It will be open to the entire community from 11 to 1230. Especially all children of all ages. We hope to encourage to be there. We will have 20-25 minutes of music and prayer and a Bible story at the very beginning and then an hour plus of free swim and play. And then we will send all the kids home with a snack bag. And one day we're working on which day exactly we will have a potluck or a meal afterwards. That is a particularly good day for the church family to come, enjoy food, and get to know some of these new young disciples that we have met. Um, it's just so important to keep connecting with everybody in our community. And certainly over food is a great way to do it. Speaking of food, you will see um, this year on all of the signage, we are calling it Stories, Songs, and Swimming, aptly named because while we are there, we will be doing stories, songs, and swimming. We are again asking for donations for the snack bags to sort of help offset that part of the expense of this program. You see a list. Uh, there. We're going to make all the snack bags the same, so if you wanted to start flooding us with items from that list, we would love it. We will pack them up and have them ready. It's a really neat opportunity to reach out to the kids of this community where they already are, so I hope in prayer, by invitation, and by sharing, you will be able to support these three weeks of mission work right here. You see thank yous, you see this meals, this meals, huh, must be hungry, this week's Meals on Wheels volunteers listed. A couple real common questions are, how do I know where the houses are? When you arrive at the hospital to pick up your food, you'll be given the list of homes to deliver to, um, and so you'll know that day. That's another common question. Mm -hmm. Another common question is, what do I do if I can't reach them? And on the sheet you'll be given, it tells you, you could leave it in the mailbox for this home, you can put it on the front porch, um, you can always call, you have the phone number of the family, and you can always call the hospital too. So all that information will be coming to you. It's very well organized, and we thank all those who have volunteered and all those who have volunteered to be substitutes. You see PW? On the back, all of their activities are coming up. In the next few weeks, we are actually uh, empty of liturgists on our calendar. So when you walk in the office door, there's that calendar right here. If you sign your name next to liturgist, we will know that you will be up here reading with me. Or if you just tell me, I will try really hard to remember. But we do need liturgists for the next couple of weeks. Are there any announcements I have forgotten? Leftover or neglected? 
then let us continue in worship together. Good morning. Good morning. Please join in our call to worship. In the beginning, God created all things. And God saw that they were good. At our beginning, God created us. Unique and irreplaceable, loved and wanted by God, known and treasured even before our Creator created us. In all our new beginnings, God creates something new. So we will seek God in the freshness of this morning, in the laughter of friends, in the colors of creation, and in this beautiful place. Lord God, King of creation, open our eyes to see your presence, our souls to sense your presence, and our hearts to love you. Please join in our first hymn today, number 644, God Who Stretched the Spangled Heavens.
prayer of confession. Confident in God's grace, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and soul and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend. Assurance of forgiveness. Hear the good news. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Friends, believe the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Well, today for our sermon warm-up, I want to talk a little bit about where you are right now, the sanctuary. And we're going to learn a little bit more about the sanctuary during the sermon. But my question to you is, what is one meaningful event, happening moment, that has taken place inside of this sanctuary for you. You can be very specific or very vague, and you get about three sentences to be either of those. You joined the church, yes. The first day, my mom and daughter. The first day you came here with your mom and your daughter, all together. Being ordained as an elder. Being ordained as an elder. Both being married here and having both of your daughters baptized here. You and Tom being married here by Reverend Gilmore almost 40 years ago. Sharon. Your baptism in 1944, you were in seventh grade. Tammy. Becoming a member and having your daughter confirmed here. Claire was the first child uh, baptized in this new building. Claire was the first child baptized in the new, newly renovated building, the sanctuary. And Julie's funeral was here. And Julie's funeral was here. All the times you have the privilege of standing up in front of the choir and sharing all of your gifts together. This space has held a lot, huh? A lot of memories and powerful, powerful memories here. Yes, Paula. as a little girl coming to the older church and then coming back as an adult to this new sanctuary but still getting to see the preserved older windows helps you reflect on both the past and the present in a really beautiful way. Which I think is a great segue to my second question, which is if you were to dream, dream big, nobody's writing and it doesn't even have to be practical, what would you like to see happen in this sanctuary? What's something you dream? Yes, Jim. See it filled. Filled. More children. More children. Mm -hmm. About three more things we would like to see in this sanctuary. Yes, yes. The Messiah done. The Messiah done. Handel's Messiah shared. Yeah. 
Be soon. Non-believers coming into this place and finding Christ here. Two more. I can't do math, and these are wonderful. Two more dreams. Look around at the space. Anything you'd like to see used or utilized, shared with those outside the space? Anything else that can happen in here, maybe other than just Sunday morning worship? Well, since I've already given you my closing sentences, I will let it go there. But continue to think each week as you're in this space, both remembering the blessings that have happened to you here, but what is your dream for the future? What would you like to see happen here? if you are dreaming big. And maybe even think about what's one first step we could make together to making our dreams of sharing Jesus Christ with all those around us come true. Let us listen to the choir. <coughs>
Our scriptures today come from 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verses 11 to 21. Then David gave his son Solomon the plan of the vestibule of the temple and of its houses, its treasuries, its upper rooms, and its inner chambers, and of the room for the mercy seat, and the plan of all that he had in mind for the courts of the house of the Lord, all the surrounding chambers, the treasuries, sorry, screwed that up anyway, <laughs> for the divisions of the priests and of the Levites, and all the work of the service in the home of the Lord, for all the vessels for the first service in the house of the Lord. The weight of gold for all golden vessels for each service, the weight of silver vessels for each service, the weight of the golden lamps, lampstands and their lamps, the weight of gold for each lampstand and its lamps, the weight of silver for a lampstand and its lamps, according to the use of each in the service. The weight of gold for each table for the rows of bread, the silver for the silver tables, and pure gold for the forks, the basins, and the cups, for the golden bowls and the weight of each, for the silver bowls and the weight of each, for the altar of incense made of refined gold and its weight. Also his plan for the golden chariot of the cherubim that spread their wings and covered the ark of the covenant of the Lord. All this in writing at the Lord's direction, he made clear to me the plan of all the works. David said further to his son Solomon, be strong and of good courage and act. Do not be afraid or dismayed, for the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the house of the Lord is finished. Here are the divisions of the priests and the Levites for all the services of the house of God, and with you in all the work will be every volunteer who has skill of for any kind of service. Also the officers and all the people will be holy at your command. Today we come to the letter I in our alphabet of faith. And if you look at the sermon title in your bulletin, you see the letters I-H-S. I-H-S. Does anybody know where those letters are found in our sanctuary? I'll give you a hint. You are all facing them now. Reverend Gilmore doesn't get to play this game. <laughs> Yes, up here on the communion table, I-H-S. Now there's a lot of guesses as to what I-H-S means. In our scripture reading this morning, we see that sanctuaries don't just happen, even in biblical times. They are carefully ordained and ordered by God, and God cares about the details that are around us, what they teach us, what they show us, how they bless us. And so today I thought we'd learn a little bit about our sanctuary and see what that knowledge can give to us. So the IHS, did I already tell you there's a lot of wrong answers? And there's one right answer. Anybody wanna guess? That is one of the common but incorrect answers in his service. Oh, see, now no one wants to guess anymore. I'll tell you all the common but incorrect answers first. How's that? In his service is the usual guess. Some have wondered if the letters might stand for Jesus Hominum Salvador. Jesus, the Savior of men. 
Some say that this is derived from Constantine's vision when he saw a cross with the inscription in hoc signio vinces, in this sign you shall conquer. But historically, that isn't quite right. And so the accepted academic answer is that this is actually the shortening of the Greek version of Jesus' name. It's called a monogram. It takes the three strong sounds from the six-letter Greek word for Jesus, and it puts them here. And so it is literally Jesus' name on this table. As long as we're talking about the table, what do we call that table? Communion table, yep. What don't we call that table? Altar. altar, that's right. We do not call it an altar. We believe, and Presbyterians believe, that this table represents the memory of a meal, right, that Jesus shared with his disciples, and that that is what is evoked at communion. When we use the word altar, or other denominations use the word altar, it evokes the image of a sacrifice. It's drawn from scriptures from the Old Testament, such as in Genesis, where it talks about, oh, see what happens when I start talking without looking at my paper? <laughs> oh, I've lost it. In Genesis, there is a scripture. that you can all look up for homework. <laughs> and it talks about offering sacrifices to the Lord. And you'll just have to believe me on this. Throughout scripture, there's a lot of references to making sacrifices to the Lord, right? But who do we believe made the one and only sacrifice, one time sacrifice necessary for the forgiveness of all of our sins? Jesus Christ. Whew, okay, good. And so that's why we do not call this an altar. It is not a sacrifice that is repeated here. It is the memory of a meal. So as long as we're in this center section, let's keep moving up to our cross. This is based on a Celtic cross. The Celtic cross has a legend behind it. And what makes it the Celtic cross is that circle in the middle. If you see them, often they have the intricate Celtic uh, knotwork on them, if you see them in stone. Um, Irish folklore says that St. Patrick introduced this cross to the Celts when he was trying to educate and convert the pagan Irish to Christianity. The pagan Celtic people worshipped the sun. And so, according to legend, St. Patrick took the cross and the sun and laid the cross over the sun to show that Jesus Christ was stronger than what they worshipped and also to absorb their image of the holy, the circle of light, the sun, into what we understand to be holy. Now, this is legend. Does anyone know another meaning of the circle? Where's the beginning of that circle? Where's the ending? It's an unending circle or unending life in Jesus Christ. Now, sometimes we have I would call it a regular cross. We could call it an empty cross. What I'm comparing it to is perhaps like a crucifix. Does anybody know why we don't have crucifixes in this sanctuary? We worship the risen Christ. During the time of the Reformation, Protestants put aside the image of the crucifix and decided what we wanted to proclaim was that Jesus is alive and walks among us and is risen from the tomb. 
And so this is the cross that took on theological importance and more popularity. As long as we're talking about crosses, if you look on our screen, smile at me when you see what I'm talking about. Oh, good. Okay. This is the Presbyterian cross. This is one of the coolest things about being Presbyterian. Do you know how many symbols are included in this cross? That's right, quite a few. <laughs> so we're going to look at this cross in terms of the symbols that make it up, in terms of the symbols that make up our faith. The main symbols in this cross are scripture, a dove, flames, and of course the cross itself. Perhaps you see in that top segment a descending dove, symbol of the Holy Spirit. It affirms the role of the Spirit of inspiring scripture in our lives. Anybody know a Bible story where a dove comes down from heaven and Jesus is present? Baptism. Baptism, yes. So as you see the dove, if you look at the next two lines, you see a Bible, an open Bible, because to Presbyterians, to Protestants, the word of God being read and understood is so important. And so in our cross, there is the Bible, and you see a lectern if you look at that third line, and then the base. So this is what I'm talking about here, here. Just like over there, the lectern has the open Bible, and then the lectern on it. The flames themselves have a double meaning. They remind us of the Old Testament where God spoke to Moses from a burning bush. And they remind us of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was given to all of us and the church was birthed. Beyond those commonly seen symbols, if you look inside the dove, just the centerpiece, what do you see? Ignore the wings. Fish. A fish, that's right, and a fish was an early symbol for Christianity. If you look at the center line of the body of the cross and the bottom, do you see anything there? A little dip. The baptismal, the baptismal font is one thing that is seen there. And sometimes that very same line, that dip line and bottom, is seen as the chalice, the communion chalice. If you look at this cross for a while, you might even see something else. But it is really neat that our seal, our cross and bodies in it, teaches us and reminds us of the essentials of our faith. If we keep moving this way, all the way, I wonder uh, if anyone knows, Elsie is not allowed to play this game, <laughs> where the word thimble is in our sanctuary. Where is the word thimble in our sanctuary? Jim? From one of the stained glass windows. It is one of the stained glass windows. The furthest one up here, closest to the balcony, is from the thimble club. Who here? knew we used to have a thimble club. In fact, lots of churches had thimble clubs back in the day. From the late 1800s to the mid 1900s, this was one of the very active women's groups here. Um, along with the Ladies Aid Society, the Missionary Society, and the Westminster Guild. The Thimble Club provided women with a place outside the home to use their talents and to contribute to the work of the local church. Thimble Clubs were so popular, both in larger cities and in smaller cities, that sometimes they were even mentioned in the newspapers, their work. They were talked about on the society pages. 
And so it might have said uh, where the various members of the clubs visited for the weekends, who took rides in newfangled automobiles, and what thimble clubs were up to in serving the mission of the church. I would add, if you would like to know more about any of the windows or any of the items or the history of the space, Elsie has written a book on the history of this sanctuary. She has been spending years on the history of this place. This book is not allowed to leave the office, but you're welcome to come visit me and look at it. We do have a copy that is allowed to leave the office, and there will be more in this series thanks to Elsie's gracious time about the people and the ministries of this place as well as the building. All right, we've gone up and around, and now you have to look through that wall, window, and up. What's up there? When you walk in every week to the narthex above the office door, do you know what you see? A quilt. And do you know what that quilt is made from? Ties. Whose ties? The men of the church, and it was sewed by Rebecca Shell, and it still lives up there as a memory of members gone by. Anybody here have a tie in that quilt? Okay. <laughs> you, you might. Your wife might have given one. You don't know. <laughs> Our sanctuary is a melting pot of symbols and memories. Some evoke thoughts all the way back to creation, all the way back to the time of Jesus Christ. Some of these memories are recording a point in the historical timeline of the church or of our church. But we who believe in the communion of saints should feel comforted looking around and seeing all these signs and symbols of those who have gone before us. They are still here, and they are still teaching us. If you know special stories of this space, I would invite you to share them with me, with one another, so that the voices of those long gone can live on through our sanctuary and as always, let's take a minute during our week to think about what we would like to leave behind in this space. What is it important that we, the church family, right now want to leave an indelible mark so that others will know this was important to us here? I commend it to your prayer life. And I lift up a prayer of thanks for this beautiful space and all who created it and all who care for it. Let us continue with our next hymn. <laughs>
friends, we come to this meal, and it has many names. It is called the Lord's Supper. It reminds us that Jesus is the host, and we are the guests invited. It is called the Eucharist, and Eucharist means thanksgiving. It is called communion, the drawing together, this time when we and Christ come very close together. We and the communion of saints are especially interwoven, and we and the people next to us and the churches around the globe that share in this meal today find a special unity. And so we are invited with thanksgiving to Jesus' table where we meet him. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Gracious God, creator of all things, we know that in the beginning you created everything and called it good. We also know that from the beginning we did not listen to your will or your way, but turned aside to chase after our own desires. We give you thanks that you have never given up on us and have never stopped loving us. You sent prophets and priests, judges and kings to call us back to your way. And in the fullness of time, when even these were not enough, you sent your only Son, our Lord, that by his life we might learn how to live, and by his death we might have open to us the gates of eternal life. We ask that you would send your Holy Spirit upon us this morning and upon our gifts of bread and juice. May the bread that we break and the cup that we bless be the body and blood of Christ for us. May it unite us with the faithful of every time and place until we are at last gathered together at your heavenly banquet table. All this we pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, three in one, now and always. Amen. You remember on the night when Christ was betrayed, he sat at table with the disciples, and after having given thanks to God, he took the bread and broke it, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Whenever you eat of it, remember me. We invite you to partake of your bread now. After the meal, he took the cup, and he said, This is the cup of the new covenant, poured out for the forgiveness of your sin, poured out in my blood. Whenever you drink of it, remember me. We invite you to partake of your cup now. we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we do indeed remember the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is for each of us, and we await his coming again. Let us thank God for this meal that we have received, sharing in the prayer which is written in our bulletins. Let's bow our heads. God of power, 
May the boldness of your spirit transform us. May the gentleness of your spirit lead us. May the gifts of your spirit be our goal and strength, now and always. Amen. Let's stand and sing our final hymn. Go in peace, remember the Lord's presence often, and take strength from the knowledge that the one who calls also sends and sustains. May the Lord bless us as we walk the way of Christ Jesus, in thought, word, and deed. May his life be our guide, now and always. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> 